Let's begin by <clears throat> turning our attention to a few verses in Romans 5. Romans chapter 5. In the midst of Paul developing <clears throat> this exposition of the gospel, he says with confidence in verse 1 of chapter 5 of Romans, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And he says, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, and not only so, but we glory, use that word again, in tribulations also. How so, he goes on to say, knowing or because we know, because we know that tribulation worketh patience, and we've learned that word means endurance, and patience or endurance, experience, which is Christian character, proven character, Christian integrity, and experience, or that proven character, hope. Hope in the Bible is a confident expectation. He goes on to say, and hope maketh not ashamed, which we, we could render doesn't disappoint. Hope doesn't disappoint because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. He goes on and speaks about God giving Christ for us when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God committeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified goes back to verse number one. By his blood we also we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, that's when he justified us by his blood, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, declared righteous, we shall be saved by his life, resurrection life. He cir circles back to what he said in verse number three, now in verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. In verse 2, we glory or rejoice also in tribulations. In verse 11, we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn over, if you would, to 1 Peter. I have three references for you. The second of those is 1 Peter. In chapter number 1, Peter speaks in some of the same words that Paul does in other places in regards to God's saving work, provision for us, his initiative in these things, communicates grace and peace. And then in verse number three of 1 Peter chapter number one, we read, blessed, <clears throat> blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You're hearing some of the same terminology that Paul uses. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you, for you who, who are kept, guarded, protected by the power of God through faith and to salvation, ready to be revealed or ready for us in the last time. Wherein we greatly rejoice... So he's drawn all these things together. And then in the midst of that, he says in verse 6, Though now, for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Grief, challenges of all kinds. That the trial of your faith, verse 7, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now back to James chapter number one, please. James, back a book to chapter number one. He 
And James, who was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, who served and ministered in the Jerusalem church. Now that church is scattered because of the persecution. And so mostly Jewish believers are now scattered, as we read in the book of Acts. And James is writing to them. Many would place James record his epistle as the very first epistle of the New Testament because of the timing of that. And he writes, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, which would be an Old Testament terminology for God's chosen people. But in this case, it'd be Jewish believers, 12 tribes, which are scattered abroad. Greeting. And then he writes, very similar to what we read in Romans and in 1 Peter, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man, that wavering man, think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Reason, verse 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He makes reference to a man of low degree, to a rich man. And then down in verse number 12, he brings it back around and says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. We have our enemy, Satan. We have the world. And we have our flesh. And all three of those are enemies of what God is seeking to do in our lives. And sometimes at the most unexpected, inopportune times, we suffer an attack. Uh, you don't have to be with anybody. You can be all by yourself. And yet, because of that flesh we read about this morning, learned a little bit about this morning, it's, it's a very real, very uh, energized warfare. And I, when I find myself there, I find myself immediately going to the book of James. And the reason that is, is because I need to hear from the Lord once again things that I know that he said, but I need to hear them um, afresh. And so, and thinking in those terms, I entitle this afternoon, but this seems so hard sometimes. <laughs> this idea of rejoicing in difficulty, of dealing with the issues of our flesh, of dealing with collisions in our relationships, even with people we love and cherish, that we would never want to hurt. Uh, but we do, and we make assumptions, or we say things we shouldn't say, and we recognize there's a breach um, in the relationship, and we remember Paul said, <laughs> my indwelling sin is the problem, instead of hers or his, Paul says, no, my indwelling sin is the problem, my Biggest challenge is me. Your biggest challenge is you. And so in thinking in those terms of rejoicing, <laughs> counting it all joy, that's one of those Pauline words, isn't it? The idea of reckoning, my brethren, verse 2, count it all joy, reckon it joy. Now, he's not talking about pleasurable <laughs> or enjoyment. <laughs> this is great. You know, you're under the load and you're bent over and somebody says, how you doing? I'm doing great. And I'm thinking, you had to say it like that it tells me that's not true. <laughs> right? That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, bring it on. Just bring it on. That's not what he's talking about either. He's not talking about pleasurable or enjoying, but rather choice of understanding and response. A choice of understanding and response. Count it all joy. So God has given us instruction not only from Paul, but he's given us instruction from Peter and James. I've referenced this from time to time with you in passing. 
this afternoon count it all joy, but, but that seems so hard sometimes. We're not talking about pleasure or enjoyment, but rather a choice based on understanding. Consider it joy. Reckon it joy. Come to the conclusion that I should rejoice in this. How, James says, here's how. You've got to understand what God's doing. It's, what's, it's the same thing Peter said. It's the same thing Paul said differently. A choice based on understanding. Come to a conclusion about the trial. In this case, divers' temptations. Count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. That's various trials, all sorts all sorts of trials, right? Trials at all times, different times. I understand a trial this way to be something that was unexpected. You fall into, you fall. I didn't get up this morning knowing this was coming. It was, there I am, it happened, unexpected. I think this trial is unwelcomed. You say, what do you think about trials? I just welcome them. I don't. And I don't think James would talk about it or Paul would talk about it or Peter would talk about it. If that's the way Christ approached it or anybody else is supposed to approach it. It's unexpected. It's unwelcomed. These diverse temptations at different times in different fashions are unexpected, unwelcome. And I would add they're unde undesired. They're undesired. And Paul's going to, uh, James is going to return to this issue later in chapter 5. He's going to come right back around to it. And I think that's part of the beauty and, and understanding of James is he just, he just circles these different themes, brings them back at different places. Look at chapter 5 and verse number 7, if you would, for just a moment. And he's talking about affliction again. Be patient. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, just like that husbandman. Do this, establish your hearts. Know this, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Understand this and avoid this. Grudge not one against another, brethren, unless ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren, the prophet, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. And he references the patience of Job. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So once again, this idea of steadfastness, this idea of understand what's going on. Think about what's going on. And this, this is a renewal process. You got to think right about this. If, if you don't, the transformation process is short-circuited. I don't read any of the New Testament writers who say transformation is easy. The only way I think we would think transformation is easy is if we didn't think there was so much about us that needed to be transformed. But I think when we come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ, we recognize this transformation process is hard. And you've got to think that way. You've got you to address it that way. Wherever you are and wherever the conflict is, he says, knowing this, I'm back in James 1 verse 3. Knowing this, how can I count it all joy? A choice based on understanding. Well, here it is. Knowing this, verse 3 of James 1, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. That's the word endurance. This is the key. This is crucial to understanding. This is crucial to rejoicing. This is God's purpose in these various trials. The testing process is intended to yield fruit. And that fruit is endurance. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith 
worketh produces endurance. So instead of wishing there was some way you could get out of the situation you're in, change the circumstance that you are dealing with. No, that trying, that testing of your faith is working endurance in your life. And the only way, as we learn from Paul, the only way you can learn endurance is by enduring. And the only way you can endure is by being in a trial. Being in difficulty. I got to think differently about that. Because my human side thinks anything but the difficulty. My, my human side says, why can't we just fix it? Not only me, but you. Why don't you just fix it? Right? Or as the great counselor said, I can counsel anything in two words. Stop it. And I've, I've tried that. Laura loves that. She really appreciates that, right? Stop it. That's it. Well, it kind of fixes it, doesn't it? We're, we're laughing because we know how ridiculous that is. Because not only is that not possible, but that is a wrong view of the test. It's a wrong view of the hardship. Don't stop it. Use it, Lord. So you're in conflict and you go to your corners. What do you do? You pick up your Bible and you read the book of James. And you renew your mind. And you stop thinking, I'm irritated. You start understanding God's doing something in this. You don't ghost the relationship, which is a current term because it's a current practice. I'm done with you. I am done with you. Is that an option for believers with anybody? Now, if somebody's done with you, you can't do anything about that. But to, to say, I'm done with you, that's unbelieving, right? That's what unbelievers do. And so be it a relationship or a situation, the first answer is not change the situation. The first answer is not change that person that has caused this difficulty for you. It's, Lord, change me. As I rejoice in this hardship that's bringing to the surface things I didn't expect, things I didn't see. And I suspect that you agree with me in the fact that that's going to happen until Jesus takes us home. We're going to be in process. There are no expert Christians they might parade around and talk about one subject that they think they've got all figured out and boxed in. There are no experts except Jesus Christ. And so there are things that we do not see that the, the hot water, the difficulty in our life brings to the surface. So James says, knowing this, the key and crucial to our understanding, crucial to joying is to understand God's purposes in these various trials. This testing process is intended to yield the fruit of endurance and perseverance. It's a perfecting work. Let patience, he says in verse 4, have her perfect or perfecting work. Let this perseverance accomplish its aim, and that aim is to mature me. The word there is teleos for finish. Jesus says, it is finished. That's the same word. Let that endurance have its finishing work. Bring to completion what God is doing, maturing you into Christ's likeness so that you will be what? Wanting nothing. Those two words at the end of verse number four means lacking nothing. Without lack. This idea of maturity in Christ in every part of my life. Specifically, what part right now in that situation, whatever part God brought to the surface, that's what I got to deal with right now. Why? Because that's where I'm lacking. And when you see it over and over and over again, you're like a bumper car bumping off of people. It's time to stop and say, that's where I'm wanting. That's where I'm lacking. That's where I need God to keep the fire turned up until he brings it to the surface and deals with it. 
Let patience have her perfecting work in every part. That's how we grow up spiritually. So I would start by encouraging you this afternoon that I'm hearing from James that we need to afresh, appreciate afresh the refining process. We need to appreciate afresh the refining process. This is going to be very simple and very straightforward. But in, in response to, but this seems so hard sometimes, I'm saying to you, James is saying that we need to appreciate afresh the refining process. Secondly, we need to respond in such a way as to grow up spiritually. We are to respond in such a way as to grow up spiritually. Count it all joy. Let God drill down on that which is needful where I am lacking. Appreciate afresh the refining process. Secondly, respond in such a way as to grow up spiritually. And thirdly, and this one stings, I know, but we need to live expectant that there is much in me that needs transformation. Paul called himself chief of sinners as the very last thing later in his life and ministry. Appreciate afresh the refining process, respond in such a way as to grow up spiritually and live expectant that there is much in me that needs transformation. In that case, James is indicating that that's where we're positioned to grow up. That's how we're settled against selfish reactions. As Paul says in Romans 7, my problem is within. Live expectant that there is much in me that needs transformation. The impact of that is that I'm positioned now to grow up spiritually. And I'm also settled against selfish reactions. He goes on in verse number five to tell us what we ought to do. So I'm in the heat of this. I'm seeking to respond to right. What then am, am I to do? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not and it shall be given him. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the God granted insight. It's the God granted insight into how to apply revealed truth to each situation in life in a practical way. You can scour the book of Proverbs and find this, and we have not time this afternoon to do this. This is not innate. None of us have this. None of us inherit this. We have to ask this of God. Wisdom is the God-granted insight into how to apply revealed truth, which is called knowledge in Proverbs, to each situation in life in practical ways. The God granted insight into how to apply revealed truth, which is knowledge, to each situation in life in practical ways. Ask God for wisdom. What does God have for me in this? What is he bringing to my attention in this? What, where is the specific lack of Christ likeness evident in me in this? How is my own deficiency being brought to light in this pressure situation? Wisdom that God granted insight into how to apply revealed truth, knowledge, to each situation in life in practical ways. When do I need that? When I'm in it. When I'm in it. When do I need to know how to apply revealed truth to a given situation, when I'm in that situation, when I find myself in that situation. I need spiritual insight from God. I need spiritual insight from God. Sometimes that's communicated by those in authority over us who are taking care of us. But all of us need this daily, moment by moment. And so God says, here's the invitation. 
If any of you lack wisdom, or since you do lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That is not innate in any of us. We don't know that in every situation. Now, you've heard these kind of things, and I've heard these kind of things very... Um, I can't, I, I'm not finding my word, but answers. This is what you do in this situation every time. I, I've, I don't know how much of that I've heard over the years. Pastors' meetings. And so, okay, we get in line, we start trooping along. This happens in our church. This is what you do every time in that situation. Boom, here's what we're doing. You just bypassed dependency upon the Lord. You just bypassed seeking wisdom from God. You just bypassed the fact that every one of us is different. Every one of us is different as individuals. Every one of our situations is different. God is not guiding us to make those kind of decisions the same in every given situation. There is no book on this. And that's by God's design because he wants us to do what? Well, I'll tell you what I did last time, and that's what I'm going to do next time. And that's Really? What Bible are you reading? Proverbs says you're a fool. There it is. And that word doesn't mean empty-headed. That means morally in the wrong place. A fool is morally in the wrong place. That's wrong this way, right? Wisdom is spiritual insight from God. It's communicated to us in the midst of the situation we're in, and it's based on revealed truth. So we fill our reservoir with truth. Fill our reservoir with truth. I, I, I just can't, I can't abide being around people that have the answer to everything. God resisteth the proud. I feel like God will resist the proud. But they feel like... Here you go. Here you go. I'm saying in my mind and never out loud so far. Why don't you just hush? Why don't you just hush? You're walking around like you got everything all figured out. But God says, ask him for wisdom. Which tells me I got very little figured out. And there's not an answer book that says, in that case, A, in that case, B, in that case, C. In every case, ask God. Ask God. Show me. How many of you know your heart fully this afternoon? Show me my heart, Lord. In this situation, I need an understanding of your insight into how to apply revealed truth to my own heart, first and foremost. Ask of God. I love what it tells us about God, because I don't think this way naturally about God. I need to be told, and I think you do as well. But it says in the middle of verse 5, this about God, he giveth to all men liberally, generously. I love the idea of generosity, because generosity reflects my heavenly Father, who doesn't withhold what we need. Knowing our need. He gives to all men liberally. He does not withhold what we need. Knowing what we need. Secondly, he, it says he does not abrade. He doesn't scold us while he's giving us wisdom. Why? Because we're right where we need to be when we recognize we need it. Right? He doesn't scold us. He doesn't reproach us. Reproach is never in his response. He gives to all men liberally. All men, all men liberally. If you will ask, he will never withhold what we need. Because he knows it perfectly. He won't upbraid us. He won't scold us. He won't reproach us. And he promises, doesn't he? To meet our need. You see all that in verse 5? He giveth to all men liberally, generously. He upbraideth not. He doesn't scold us. And it shall be given him. It shall be given in response to the request. Now, if I don't ask, if I don't ask, there's nothing here for me. But if I ask, it tells me he will give that to me. But then it goes on to say, now, this is how you need to approach God. Let him ask in faith. I, call, I understand faith 
as an utter dependency upon God. Let him ask in faith. I see it as utter dependency upon God, and I see it as, as confidence in God. How am I to ask for this much-needed wisdom? I am to ask in faith, nothing wavering, without any doubting. The reason that is, is he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. A storm-tossed wave of the sea. He says something very strong in verse 7. Let not that man, that double-minded man, that man that's being back and forth like a wave, a sea a storm surge, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Because that's an unbelieving response, isn't it? And he goes on to say about that man, because that man's double-minded, in verse number 8, means he's facing both ways at once. He's back and forth between faith and doubt. I heard some things about this in Sunday school this morning. He's, he's back and forth between faith and doubt. He's unstable in all his ways. He, he lacks spiritual stability. He makes wavering decisions. So we're picking up the threads of these things this afternoon. This seems so hard sometimes. James knows of the life transforming work of Christ. He was an unbelieving half brother who ended up being a leader in the Jerusalem church. He expresses complete confidence in God and the Lord Jesus Christ and ministers to other believers. He serves the scattered church as he writes this letter. His former parishioners have now been driven out of Jerusalem and they're out there in hardship. And he says to them in verse 2, respond aright to every trial that comes to you. Those unexpected, unwelcomed, undesirable things and choose joy because of what you've come to understand that God is doing, verses 3 and 4. These are needful, these are purposeful, these promote hum uh, humility and maturity in Christ-likeness. These grow us up spiritually so that we will be lacking in nothing. Appreciate afresh the refining process, ask for wisdom and humility and faith, and avoid the inconsistency of a storm-tossed life. Because God's goal in this is spiritual wholeness, integrity. And these are the things the Lord has for us. And these are the things that help us and bring us to a consistent and undivided commitment and devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. You run to him, I run to him, we run to him, and we will find a sweetness that we'll never want to miss. It won't be bringing on, I can handle it. There won't be any of that. It'll be, Lord, here we are again. You knew this before it ever happened. And I want you to do your work through this. I want to respond in such a way as to expect that you will build endurance into my life and shape me more and more into Christ's likeness. Father, we thank you for your word. And our experiences are not the source of truth, but our experiences many times affirm what we know to be true from your word. And some of the lessons that we learn through these experiences seem to go deep sometimes because the experience is repeated over and over again. Try to bring us along. Try to fix where there's lack. So, Father, we've gathered in this place on another Lord's Day, and we've gloried in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've appreciated the honesty of Paul being so very personal in his application of the gospel. Now, we've sat for a few minutes this afternoon. We've sung praise to you. We've ministered to one another and our own souls with these songs. We've heard from three different men focusing in on what James has said here. Father, we're rebuked that we ever think we have it together. Rebuked that we ever look at our own history and our own heritage and think somehow we've got things figured out. Father, it moves us away from this dynamic of a relationship with you that's utterly dependent upon you. 
and tells us that you will grant grace to those that are lowly and you resist the proud. So I'm praying for me, I'm praying for your people. I'm praying for this fellowship that we will step back, that we will be honest about our pride, honest about what we think we know, where we think we've arrived to just lay it all down, come as little children. Say, Lord, I like wisdom here. And I'm going to choose to believe and embrace that this difficulty is a good thing. Because you tell me what you're doing is you're building endurance into my life. You're building Christian character into my life. And I'm coming to you asking you for wisdom. I need the insight from you to apply the things that I know from your word. And that won't be cemented. That won't be mechanical. That will be relational. That will be as I'm walking before you, as I'm walking with you, as I'm hearing from you. May this become very personal to us. May we benefit from our time here among your people today. I praise you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Take time to be holy. Four hundred and